I apologise profusely in advance for my inability to pronounce Welsh well, other than look you and isn't it? Hello lovelies, I've been challenging myself in this new year to do a lot more reading and I just finished another book. I used to read voraciously and constantly for, for leisure. There's a lot of other demands on my time and I do a lot of reading for work which kind of took the shine off uh, the last few years so I haven't been reading anything like as much as I normally would or ought to be or would like to be. And uh, I've kind of thrown myself in the deep end with some academic works but this time fortunately the one I was reading kind of ties into some of the conversation and zeitgeist that's going on some of which we t we talked about yesterday so I have sort of reread the Malbinogian whose name I'm probably mispronouncing terribly um, this is a series of Celtic myths, Arthurian romances, interpretations of British history, and it's an oral history coming out of Wales. So immediately I have a problem in that I don't speak Welsh, so my pronunciations were all off, and it made it very difficult to read. Plus, it's more of a translation than a, a retelling. Um, and so it's it's not meant to be read, it's meant to be spoken. And so there's a lot of repetition, a lot of similar phrasing and so on that can cause your eyes to glaze over, though many of the stories are relatively mercifully short. It is worth a read if you can get hold of a copy, but I would say don't get the translation. Uh, get Get a retelling or an interpretation of it. I mean, the way it's written reminds me of an, of an old joke by the League Against Tedium, Simon Munnery, where he says, Imagine the history of the world as one enormous run-on sentence with, and then what happened was, between, <laughs> between every event. And that's kind of what it feels like. I'm going to murder, murder the pronunciation, but let, let me try and demonstrate. Madoc, son of Maradud, ruled Powys from one end to the other. That is, from Porford to Gwufan, in the uplands of Awistli. At that time he had a brother whose rank was not equal to his. His name was Yoerth, son of Maradud, and Yoerth became greatly concerned and saddened to see the honour and power possessed by his brother, and he with nothing. So he sought out his companions and foster brothers, and consulted with them as to what he should do about it. They decided that some of them should go and ask Madoc for assistance. Uh, for maintenance. Madoc offered him the position of the head of the retinue and equal standing with himself and horses and armour and honour and 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 so it goes. So it's a very difficult read but it is very interesting and there's a lot of kind of crossover myth between the kind of pre-Christian ideas and the fairies and the fey folk and magicians and just wandering weirdness and the more Christian myth. There's a lot of oaths to God throughout the book and they seem to be binding and magical. And a lot of this comes out of the culture of Wales at the time which was very much divided up into different segments and according to the laws of the time both legitimate sons and bastards were entitled to an equal share of the father's estate when he died um, and what this led to was a lot of fratricide <laughs> and hatred and a great deal of fighting between people and a lot of underhanded tactics and a lot of death uh, shall, shall we put it that way now discussion over this um, Arthurian legend RPG has flared up due to Varg Vikern's setting uh, setting the, the twat amongst the villains and um, attacking it for its diversity appearance and, and wokeness and so on considering that we're talking about Arthurian mythology now a lot of people make the excuse oh, but dragons therefore Saracens have travelled the entire distance all the way to the UK in great numbers and have settled there uh, there are legitimate 
reasons to be concerned about this kind of rewriting of history, but then there's a lot of people like Varg that take it too far and miss the point that it's supposed to be fun. So I want to, I want to talk about that using the Melbourneogian as a sort of springboard from what I've observed while reading that to talk about these issues in a in a medieval setting um, or a mythological Arthurian setting. Now, there's the old saying that in America, 100 years is a long time. In Britain, 100 miles is a long way. And it's, it's true. There are definite linguistic and accent changes just going from one side of a county to another. And it used to be from one village to another. We weren't all on the same clock. Britain had time zones up until the time of the Industrial Revolution and the onset of the railways when people were regularly travelling and then we set an, a national time. But until then, that, that wasn't a thing. You know, you'd have Liverpool time and London time and Yorkshire time and Glasgow time and it, it, it was just absurd. Yeah, so for a huge amount of our history, we have been very divided not just in terms of England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland, but even within those areas by by counties or the older kingdoms like Wessex and Mercia and Cumbria and, and so on. And even before that, even smaller kingdoms and fiefdoms and earldoms and, and so on. So there has always been a great deal of xenophobia, uh, nationalism, fear of the other, fear of strangers, and all kinds of wild stories about people from other places, to the point where a lot of fairy myths are probably just people that washed up ashore and didn't speak the language and so on. I was reminded by a, a friend in my Discord this morning of, a, of an old story about a monkey that washed up on the shores, I think in Cornwall, possibly Devon, um, and the locals thought it was a Frenchman. Yeah, you know, and that's just the channel away. Right? There's another story where an ape washes up and they think it's a person and they dress it in clothes and so on. Apocryphal or not, I think these help to demonstrate that there was a great deal of xenophobia, of fear, of hatred, of, of the other. Right? You need only look at a school playground to see that the slightest difference from one child to the next will lead to one being bullied and attacked and this this tribalism is something very innate to humanity and it cuts both ways though we both exoticize and venerate and fetishize the other and we also fear and hate the other and it's easy to apportion blame to something that seems different less human uh, not of the same culture not of the same ethnicity just just not the same. We seem to have this enormous capacity for hatred within us all, unfortunately. Let us suppose then that you're creating a, a mythological, Arthurian, Britain-focused RPG centred around those times and those places and those myths. If you were to fairly represent the history and the mythology of the time, you would have to incorporate that. You would have to consider that just you know, you being a knight from England entering Wales or whatever analogue thereof might well be seen as an act of war and would be treated as something of real suspicion um, and, and hatred. And that's just two nations within the same landmass that border each other. You imagine a, a Saracen knight, as people have rightly pointed out, there are a lot of cases of Middle Eastern knights or Saracens or, or whatever turning up in medieval romances. That is going to be exotic and the other and potentially a threat. And they're much more obvious and easy to pick out of a crowd, shall we say, than just someone who speaks a bit funny or uh, has a different crest to the one that you're used to, which is going to be enough for there to be a problem. Now, if you homogenize, if you diversify these settings, you're losing out on a few things. And that includes that kind of roleplay. You can't be the exotic Saracen knight from another country and have it mean anything in a game where it, this is just something that's completely accepted and normal. 
you, you, you can't do that. You can't play the fish out of water in, the, in that same way. I mean, even modern interpretations of old stories, such as Robin Hood, which was very much a, a sort of successor to a lot of these earlier stories, I think, in some versions of the story, he returns with a, with a Saracen or, or some other deeply foreign figure of, of different coloured skin. In Robin of Sherwood, this was uh, Nazir, I think, and in Prince of Thieves, this was Azim. Right. And in both of those fictions, they were treated, at least initially, in a realistic fashion, with fear and curiosity and bands of children following them around and, and making fun of them and, and things like that. And then they prove themselves. I've said this before about pulps, where it's a lot more blatant. But in failing to represent the, the biases and the, the prejudices and so on of, of the past, you're doing a disservice to the people that lived through it, and you're also denying yourself that role-playing opportunity to do something with it. Whether it be playing a, a female adventuress in a Victorian setting, it's, it can be a lot more fun if you're defying expectations and the society around you isn't accepting unless you're a wealthy heiress who's allowed certain eccentricities and so on, of course. And if you're a racial minority in a setting, or essentially a, a, a freak one in a million occurrence, in the case of a Saracen knight coming to, coming to Christendom, you know, you're denying yourself that role-playing opportunity and the opportunity to stack your character with a few flaws to, <laughs> to min-max your stats. There's a lot there to work with, with story. And I know it can be tiresome to do the same thing over and over again, but it, it, it's a balance. And the great thing about RPGs is that they're DIYs. If you don't like an aspect of the setting, you can always change it. And that cuts both ways in examples like this. People like Varg, they don't speak for me, they don't speak for a lot of people. The version of the objections that they're making is not, I think, an accurate or an honest one, but nor is it honest and accurate to represent the past as being a, a wonderful rainbow land where everyone got on with each other and everything was just fine and dandy and uh, everything was ethnically diverse and there were plenty of female warrior vikings and, and whatever else. It's equally not correct to say that these times and places were completely racially homogenous. Uh, some of the Arthurian legends may come out of sort of post post Roman collapse, and the Romans almost certainly posted people of all nations uh, in Britain. It was a practice of the Romans to take troops from one area of the empire and post them in another area of the empire so that they couldn't lead uprisings in their home territories. So it was it would be completely understandable. But of course, after that period, they probably went home or intermarried and interbred so much with the local population that they essentially just vanished. Yeah, it cuts both ways. There are valid arguments against this sort of thing, which aren't really being made, and when they are, they get lumped in with the kind of things that Varg is saying, this uh, fictional, glorious white history, when in fact we were all at each other's throats for much more minor differences that were much more indetectable than race. But equally, the past is not some racially homogenous, love everybody wonderland. And here's the vital point, I think, that I want to make. Conflict is where story is, where one thing butts up against another. And there's a lot of different choices for conflict, but in making so many game backgrounds, the sort of anodyne, accepting, Pat, we are denying so much conflict of the past, so much history, so much that we can see, and we're denying ourselves the opportunity to play through that, to occupy the, the, the space that a minority might, or to occupy the space that someone with prejudice might, and to try and understand those points of view and bridge the gap. Or, purely from a fun point of view, we're denying ourselves conflict that make for satisfying stories. So if you were going to play a uh, mythologised Arthurian Britain, Britain RPG, then that quest to unite the Empire and this new idea of tolerance that you're trying to, trying to spread throughout this new kingdom, this perfect Camelot that you're recreating, that would be a great thrust for a campaign. 
Zhang. I'm terrible at pimping my stuff, so I thought dressing like a pimp might make it a little bit easier. I have blogs, blogs where you can read stuff and see things and interact with me. My main one is postmortemstudios.wordpress.com. My writing one and sort of diary blog is over at talesofgrim.wordpress.com. Hope to see you there. A problem for every games master has always been coming up with adventure ideas. For years now, Postmortem Studios has been helping out with the 100 Adventure Seeds line. These provide adventure ideas for all genres, and you can get them at RPG Now or Lulu.com. This is not a time to be dismayed. This is, this is punk rock time. This is what Joe Strummer trained you for. It is now time to go. You're a good person. It means, that means more now than ever.